Hello, everyone. It's time for Van Chicago Land Stories, the podcast. I'm your host, Pete Costanas. This is episode 178, season eight. Today's date is November 22nd, 2022. And welcome to the show. I hope you will enjoy it. On today's show, I will talk about Andy's Steakhouse in Oprah, Illinois. Also, uh, my memories of the World Book Encyclopedia, print edition. <laughs> when I was a kid. And then I'll talk a little bit about my Thanksgiving memories when I was a kid. Uh, you know, like what food we had and any anything like that. Okay. So uh, right now the program will go into a commercial break. And this program is brought to you by Like Cola. <laughs> do you remember that? Uh, I certainly do. And this was the... Uh, product of the 1980s so here's a commercial from 1982 and when the commercial is over i will come back and i will uh, talk a little bit about this cola and my memories okay thank you everyone okay two down two on clean up hitter at bat catch your signals for kelly's fastball every kid needs a dream and someone to share that dream with but there's something they don't need they don't need caffeine. That's why we created a new cola, introducing Like. Like doesn't add caffeine like Coke and Pepsi. Like gets its excitement from full, rich cola taste. Next stop, the big leagues. You don't need caffeine, and neither does your cola. Okay, everyone, I am back. I hope you liked the commercial for Like Cola. Uh, let me give you a little background of, it, of this product. Uh, it is made... Uh, it was introduced in 1982 from the 7-Up company. Uh, and then its slogan was made from the cola nut. <laughs> and it was packaged in a red and blue can. Uh, they had a diet version also, but that was with NutraSweet, if you remember that. And uh, let's see. Uh, they had commercials all through the 80s. Uh, two spokesmen that did the commercials. One was Tim Conway, the comedian from the Carol Burnett Show. Also, McHale's Navy. And Kev actor Kevin Dobson. You may know him from Crocker. I think his name Crockett or Crocker I, from Kojak. And uh, Mac McKenzie from Knott's Landing. <laughs> So they did that. And uh, it only uh, lasted only for a few years, uh, from what I remember. I remember RC Cola had uh, RC 100, and it was uh, uh, then introduced in 1980. I remember that, uh, but both disappeared. And uh, I'm trying to remember, did I ever have this cola? I think I did, maybe once or twice. And uh, that was okay. But, you know, if you don't like caffeine that makes you jittery or nervous or just uh, you can't sleep in it, like coffee, that's what it was. So, But there are products that are they do sell like that that are caffeine-free. I mean, 7-Up has always been a long time. You know, I remember the commercials and, uh, you know, any lemon-lime soda. But, you know, like Coke and Pepsi or Dr. Pepper, yeah, they're filled with caffeine, but uh, they have, uh, Coke and Pepsi have caffeine-free soda. I buy it once in a while, so that's, that's not bad because I don't want to, uh, I'm not crazy about diet soda because uh, it tastes funny, you know, like Tab, <laughs> remember that? And, uh, but they have Coke Zero and Pepsi Zero, and those are pretty good. I like those, but not caffeine-free, no. So, so I don't drink uh, soda right now. I drink like once a week. I, I drink water or juice, you know, I, uh, with my meals. You know, I drink a glass of milk every day for lunch uh, because it keeps me up. I, I avoid caffeine like about like mid afternoon to to the evening. I don't I don't have. I just have coffee in the morning. That's it. Maybe one or two cups. That's uh, because caffeine, uh, it'll keep me up like that. And uh, so that's uh, another product from the 80s that went to oblivion. <laughs> uh, that's something. Okay. At, today's, uh, at the beginning of the show, I talk about, I was going to talk about Andy Steakhouse in Oak Brook, Illinois. Also the memories of the, of the World Book Encyclopedia, uh, which I had when I was a kid in the 70s. 
Also, my Thanksgiving memories. Uh, a couple of personal things I want to tell you before I get started. What Thanksgiving's coming up in two days. One of my favorite holidays. I love it. I will. I love it so much. I really do. Christmas is my all-time favorite. Uh, Thanksgiving is. Other holidays, mm, okay. Easter is all right. Fourth of July, <laughs> no, I <laughs> don't like it. Too noisy. Halloween, ah. <laughs> that's for kids. It's not for me. You know, it's. Uh, <laughs> I won't go into that. And uh, so. I will talk about Thanksgiving, my Thanksgiving memories later on in the program. Okay. And uh, the second thing I want to tell you about is this month is Movember, which is all sh no shave November. And uh, people grow mustaches and beards in our, for cancer awareness, where it's uh, prostate cancer, testicular cancer, I can't tell you the word, and then suicide, any type of cancer. And people do this. And it's a wonderful thing. I started. Uh, the no shave about, not in the beginning of the month, maybe uh, the, the second week. And uh, right now I'm in my third week. And I'm going to, and I thought about shaving once a week, but I decided, no, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave the beard on until November 30th. And then December 1st, I'll shave it off. So I got about eight days left. So I'm going to have Thanksgiving with the, with this five o'clock shadow. <laughs> You know, so I've taken uh, I've taken photos. I've taken them today. It's on social media. You could look at it. So uh, I feel good about that. I really do. And uh, bless those people. You know, we got to fight cancer. And I'm still fighting. So uh, I'm a survivor. So we'll see. Because I'm going to my urologist on December 13th. Uh, they found a little spot on my rib. I feel a little pain, like a dull ache. From time to time, I take Tylenol, it helps, but uh, hopefully it won't spread too much. But um, we don't know what it is. It could be metast metastasis. It could, I can't even say that word. You know, uh, that's common around uh, among uh, prostate cancer uh, patients. So I think it'll be treatable. I think it will. So I'm going to take a blood test in about two weeks, and then I'll go see him. And uh, hopefully it'll be okay. All right. Right now, I will talk about Andy's Steakhouse. Uh, I posted this about a few days ago, and uh, people love miss this place so much. It was one of the few restaurants in Chicago that was top notch. It was uh, the food was excellent, the atmosphere, the building uh, location was very easy. You know, you get on to ninety four, then go to uh, Route eight, uh, Route eight eight, or if you're in the area. It was, it was located in Oak Brook, Illinois, at uh, West 22nd Street at uh, Midwest Road. And uh, a little history of that. Uh, it opened in 1922, and it was founded by a man named Andrew Lustak. And I believe it was a house uh, back then because you do, it was in du DuPage County. And it hasn't been built up. It's all farmland. It was like the uh, middle of nowhere, you know. And uh, can you, well, now Oak Brook is a tree. It's like, woof. They got office buildings and uh, house, beautiful homes. You know, it's a love. It's lovely over there. But it's, uh, you know, it's still quiet. But it's not like what it used to be. And uh, that opened, like I said, it opened in 1922, and it was managed by a man. His name was Horace G. Barney Barnhart. He was a former president of the Chicago District Golf Association, and uh, it, it just took off. And then uh, what's – they have uh, – in front of the building, they have uh, like a carriage or an old truck or something, and I remember that, you know. And uh, their, menu, their menu was fantastic. And I, I, wish, I wish I could find a copy of it so I could read off the items which they have. Uh, but I couldn't find anything on social media, on, uh, on the internet. I can't find it. You know, hopefully somebody has something tucked away in their house <laughs> like that. But uh, they were famous for their steaks, their seafood. They had, uh, uh, let's see, some soups, you know, like that. And uh, they served goose, duck. Uh, they had frog legs, uh, crab meat that and uh prices were 
not bad, you know. And uh, they had wonderful desserts. They had a children's menu uh, like that. And let's see, um, the bartender uh, was uh, his name was Mike Rafferty, and he was from Ireland, and he was. Uh, he was very, he entertained people. He was wonderful, especially on St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> which I've been hurt, which I've been told like that. And um, let's see. So he started there. Uh, he bought the restaurant from Barnhart in 1978. Made a little changes, not too, not too much, you know, thank God for that. Uh, I don't know where Mr. Barnhart di uh, died. I, I don't know. Um because I doubt he's alive, you know, like that. And uh, my memories of this place, I went to this uh, restaurant once. I worked at, uh, in Oak Brook. Uh, well, it's a long story. I mean, my, this company I worked with, it was located up on the north side. Then it moved downtown. Then it moved to Oak Brook for a couple of years until I got laid off. And that was 1992. I got laid off in 94. And there was a man that worked with us. He was, uh, I don't know, president or vice president. He, he's a very nice man, but he retired. And uh, I think he was forced, you know, in my opinion. That's what I've been told. And uh, they decided to have a farewell lunch at Andy's Steakhouse. And I'd never been there. And I go, oh, that sounds exciting. You know, I've heard of this place. So we all uh, got into our cars. And we went there for the lunch. And we were there for like a ooh, few hours. And it was beautiful. Oh, I remember the lobby, and uh, we had it. I'm trying to remember, did we have it downstairs or upstairs? Because downstairs was the bar. You know, they had parties there. I'm not sure. I don't remember what I ate, but I remember one thing. They served shrimp cocktails, and I ordered a shrimp cocktail uh, for the first time. I don't, I'm not a big shrimp fan. I don't like seafood that much, so why not? I'll try it. was delicious. Uh, I really liked it with the cocktail sauce and the... <laughs> The shrimps hanging on the rims on the glass. Oh, it was, it was good. I liked it. Like I said before, I don't remember what I ordered. But then uh, he made the man made a speech and he said thank you and all that. It was very nice. And uh, so that was a that was my experience of Andy's Steakhouse. <laughs> and uh, the restaurant lasted until about ninety eight ninety nine, uh, according to the article in the Chicago Tribune. Um, uh, Mr. Rafferty's son, uh, he was the manager of, rest, rest of the restaurant, excuse me, and he was killed in a plane accident in 1998. And then after that, I guess he was uh, grief-stricken, um, Mr. Rafferty, that is, and he sold the restaurant. And then he sold it. And then it was, uh, then the building was torn down, which was terrible. And now there's a Walgreens there. <laughs> And I did know about, uh, one time I went to the Oprah area around the early 2000s, and I drove by there, there was the Walgreens. And I go, oh, that's so sad. You know, that really was, you know, because it was, uh, one, that place was one of a kind. It was very unique. You know, you don't find restaurants like that uh, today. You do, but not like the old days. So uh, when I posted this picture on my social media accounts, especially Facebook, Facebook. The comments keep flowing in. People remembered this place. They loved it. Absolutely loved it. And they missed it. And they told about what food they had. And they remember. And they, and, uh, they had wonderful memories. Oh, that's, that's nice. That's very nice. Okay. Right now, uh, let's see. Next up, I will talk about... Uh, I'll talk about my Thanksgiving memories, okay? Uh, you know, because it's Thanksgiving's coming up in two days, and uh, I look forward to that. Uh, my mother's going to cook, as always. I will help her out. Uh, we usually have the, the standard uh, menu, turkey, stuffing, uh, sweet potatoes, uh, cranberry sauce. Uh, cranberry sauce, I don't like the lumpy kind. <laughs> Like the straight out of the can. My mom doesn't make it homemade. Uh, she doesn't want to bother like that. And uh, of course, pumpkin pie will have that for dessert. Uh, but for potatoes, she makes sweet potatoes. But she makes she also makes Greek style potatoes. Uh, I don't 
I like them, but I'd rather have just one kind because I'm trying to watch my weight. But she, uh, but she wants those. So they're delicious. That's the only Greek thing we have in the menu. <laughs> You know, but I know a lot of Greek people that have Thanksgiving and they make Greek dishes because a lot of people don't like turkey or they have lamb. Lamb? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> it's not Easter. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so yeah, we usually eat about six o'clock. Uh, we always do. Uh, we don't invite many people. We don't have many relatives here. Uh, I have a cousins but uh we used to have my aunt and uncle but they they're deceased now and my father's not he's deceased as well so it's just uh three of us uh, i have another brother in california he's not uh, coming so he's coming for christmas thank goodness i haven't seen him in three years um because of covid and he was sick too so i'm looking forward to that and then you know uh the usual day on a thanksgiving you know people watch football i don't i'm not a football fan uh they have the dog show on and I love the dog show, the international dog show that uh, they, I think it's held in New York. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, I remember uh, they used to show, car and when I was little, they used to show cartoons or uh, movies like that. I think they still do that, that sort of thing. And uh, so uh, usually uh, the size of the turkey, the largest my mom ever bought was maybe 15 pounds, 16, you know, if you have a big family. But usually if it's just uh, three of us, you would buy 12 with a drumstick. But now my mom, my mother buys uh, just a, bre a br turkey breast. That's it. That's very small and it's enough. And you can have leftovers. It's like that. But my favorite, my favorite smell of Thanksgiving is the sweet potatoes that's in the oven. Oof. You know, with the, uh, some people put uh, brown sugar. Uh, my mom uses maple syrup. It's it smells awesome. I love it, and it stinks up the whole house. And st it's it's great. I love that. That's a Thanksgiving memory. It's still, you know, she still does that. So, and it's a very quiet day. You know, very nice, like that. And uh, we eat very well, like that. Okay, right now I'm going to play a commercial for Butterball Turkey. This is from 1984. Uh, Butter, they still make the turkey. Remember, they used to be under Swift Premium. Do you remember that? And uh, so here is the commercial from 1984 for Butterball Turkey. It's a very funny commercial. I played this last year on my podcast. So just sit back and enjoy. Thank you, everyone. Remember, Harry, it's Marion's first holiday turkey, not a word if it's dry. Do I have to eat the turkey if it's dry? Uh-huh. It's her first turkey. It won't be juicy. What they don't know is Marion's first turkey is America's first turkey, Butterball. It's always juicy because it's specially deep basted, so every slice is moist and tender. Mmm, juicy turkey, Marion. I knew it would be. America's first turkey, Butterball. Also available fresh. Okay, everyone, I am back. I hope you enjoyed the commercial for Butterball Turkey from 1984. That was funny. <laughs> they complained they were worried about the turkey being dry. <laughs> you know, I've only, on Thanksgiving, I only vi uh, visited uh, two houses the entire in my entire life. I never, I always eaten at home. And uh, my parents never liked other people's food for some reason. Just got, they have a point. You know, I remember um, one time my brother's godparents uh, invited us in the 70s. We went there. Uh, it was very nice. You know, we got together. But, you know, the turkey was carved already and it was placed on the table. And it was cold. You know, so that wasn't not very appetizing. <laughs> I don't know why people do that. They just, uh, they cook everything, they place it on the table, and then they go and blab. <laughs> All during the day. That's that's not the way to do it. Uh, I think a lot of people, like me, prefer it hot, at least warm, <laughs> to eat like that. So, um, I don't know. That's bizarre, you know. So, I haven't been to anyone else's house since. So, uh, so my mom does the cooking, and uh, it's wonderful. You know, if she passes away, uh, uh, I'll be alone with my brother. So, we probably I doubt I'll cook it. I'll probably uh, go out and eat, you know, make a reservation or work something out. We'll see. 
But uh, for the time being, as long as she's with me right now, thank thank goodness. I'm very uh, I'm very blessed. You know, I'm very uh, uh so that's good. It's kind of sad. <laughs> okay. Uh, last thing I'm going to talk about is my memories of the World Book Encyclopedia. And I'll give you a little history of that. Uh, it is still in business. They still uh, publish it. And uh, it's based in Chicago, Illinois. And I remember Channel 9 did a segment of that on the news. And they showed uh, the office. And I forgot where it was located. Somewhere on Michigan Avenue, I think. And it was first published in 1917. <coughs> Excuse me. It was very popular. And... Uh, I my first uh, experience with the encyclopedia. I was about probably in grade school. You know, you would go to a library. You would have go to the reference section, you know, and pull out a uh, volume of the World Book. And there were other uh, types of encyclopedias. There was uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, also Funk and Wagnalls from Rowan and Martin's Laughing. <laughs> I think it's still published. I'm not sure. Um, but World Book was the one I I used, and uh, I my mother bought a set, uh, not World Book. It was the Junior World Book Encyclopedia. It was blue. I posted that photo yesterday on my page, and it was a uh, it was a smaller. Uh, this was a smaller edition of the World Book. You know, I, it was kind of cool. It was very helpful for my homework. And my book reports, you know, and I had them in my bedroom and I put them in a, I had a shelf with my desk. And I held them, those on for a while until uh, one day uh, when I was at Correa's, the elementary school, uh, in, I think, yeah, in eighth grade. And they were selling encyclopedias. Someone was selling them. And I remember my principal suggested, my, uh, suggested to my mother, hey, you want to buy a set? And then she asked me, and I said, yeah, okay. So we got the 1977 edition of World Book, and uh, we got rid of the old one, uh, the junior one. We got rid of those, and uh, I had those, uh, and they were stacked in the shelf in my room. And I used that all the time. And you know what the funny thing is? Uh, when I wasn't doing my homework or during the summer, I would read from one of those. And I don't know why, once I started reading a article or, uh, you know, like that, I would read more. So that's why I became very knowledgeable in things like history and all that. I read the encyclopedias. I read about like the United States, you know, the cities, uh, also science like that. And I did that every day when I was in high school. I did that. And, uh, we, I held on to it maybe about five or six years, and we tossed them. We got rid of them because they were uh, dated. And uh, I used to read the World Book Encyclopedia at elementary school. They used to have them in, in the back of the classroom. It was on a book, what's that, cart. And uh, sometimes I didn't want to go to recess because you know, I was bullied. That, that's a long story. So I was hiding. So I read. I read the books and I read that during class. And I got caught one time. I got I read it because <laughs> I was I didn't read. Uh, you know, I wasn't studying. I just read. Uh, I just took a volume of the World Book and just read that. You know, I was fascinated by that. And I remember the section. Um, every but there was uh, the yearbook, the World Book yearbook. They had those, and uh, that was published. Uh, it started. Uh, 1962, 60 years ago, and they had uh, the volumes like that each year. And I remember reading from probably that year until 1977. So every day at school, I would read the yearbook, and what was and that's like an almanac. And I would read like who passed away, uh, like famous people, uh, events that happened in the world. Oh, it was fun. I, I like that and. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, it's still being published, on, but it ceased. Uh, oh, here we go. Here's something history. Funk and Wagnalls was acquired by World Book, and that was in 19, 2009. And uh, the 
that ceased publication in 1997. And then, um, you know what happened? The internet came and then everything's uh, digital. So um, they do, sometimes they, uh, they do, if you want to order a print edition of the World Book, you can, if you'd like. And they use them for in libraries. So I haven't been to the library in a long time. Maybe one day I'll go check it out if it's still there. But people go on the internet, you know, and you go to worldbook.com and you can uh, search. You can do that. And uh, so that's a, that's a nice memory of growing up, you know, using the encyclopedia. You know, a lot of people think you're a nerd or a geek because you read that. Still am to this day. So that's how it was. That's how it is. That's how it was. You know, I enjoy reading. I love reading. You know, every time I visit a bookstore, like in the old days of Crocs and Bertano's at downtown on Wabash, uh, on Wabash, I love that store. I miss it. And uh, I still go to a bookstore at Barnes and Nobles. I used to go to Borders. They close. Love to go inside, you know, browse, find a seat. And sit down. I don't think I see chairs anymore in Barnes and Nobles. No, I think they took them out. That's kind of dumb. You have to go to the Starbucks. You have to go to the coffee shop. And do that. Uh, but uh, I love bookstores. Yeah, I really do. Okay, that'll be all for today. Uh, I'll do a recap what I what I talked about on this program. I talked about Andy's Steakhouse in Oakbrook, Illinois. I talked about my memories of Thanksgiving, and also my memories of having the World Book Encyclopedia in the 1970s. Oh, that's nice. Um, like I said before, Thanksgiving's come up in a couple days. I'm looking forward to that. This will be fun. Uh, one quick update about my Facebook page. Uh, I've mentioned this on the podcast in previous podcast episodes that I'm temporarily blocked. I can't update. I can't post. Uh, I think I can comment, but I can't post. And for 30 days of some silly thing that happened on my, one of my pages, it's like a copyright infringement. I tried appealing, contact Facebook, nothing. So I just waited out. So I have two more days for this block to be lifted. It'll be happening Thanksgiving morning. So I'm looking forward to it. I hope it is. I hope so. So, uh, so it'll be back to normal. But I have been posting from Instagram. I've been posting that. So that helps. I will do that. So I did that. Okay. And uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So I'll give you a quick update. So this is uh, Pete Costanz, your host for Vanishing Congolent Stories, the podcast. Thank you again for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving, you know, and, uh, and a wonderful weekend. Next episode I will do probably Saturday or Sunday, you know, during that weekend. And it's a Christmas season, so uh, hopefully I'll start doing Christmas episodes. Maybe, maybe one or maybe a couple during the month, but we will see. Okay, so this is bye bye for me. Here's Ray Rayner with his traveling music, saying bye bye bye. I'll see you soon, everyone. Take care. We have to go. Bye bye bye. <laughs>